Pakistan, two in Egypt, two in Turkey, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, these things happen, and my staff knows that we have to, uh, to do that. At any rate, thank you very much for being with us, and I'm really looking forward uh, to this panel, which I uh, believe is going to be lively, and thank you for the professors who brought their students also to be here. Fadi. So several people asked me in the last days whether we will have a session on Turkey or not. Now it's the session on Turkey. Uh, I think a lot of people are expecting like uh, to listen uh, to this um, session. We will have uh, three uh, speakers, uh, two speakers and one moderator. Um, uh, Dr. Michaello Guido, who has a PhD in political science from Italy. He has a MA degree also from in Turkish studies. Uh, from Suas University in England uh, in 2012. And he is the head of the Political Science Department and International Relation in Yermidu Kuzmais University. Uh, the floor is yours, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your invitation. Um, now, uh, I won't spend uh, too much time because I, I will keep on being a moderator here, but, uh, well, as I understood, there, was, uh, there are high expectations on this panel on Turkey, and um, probably they are right, because we have two distinguished um, experts on, um, uh, on Turkish military and uh, uh, the relations, uh, uh, well, also with the international um, perspective of the Turkish military. Now, just to say a couple of things, uh, just to uh, increase the expectancies uh, about this panel. Now, uh, the Turkish military have been uh, 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 the, the, the front runner of uh, the modernization process starting from the early uh, 19th century. And, um, well, uh, the, also the, uh, the modern uh, educated military elite starting from the late 19th century uh, by joining and uh, um, by joining the, the Young Turks movement, um, they started to, to be directly involved into politics. They also played a very important role uh, in the uh, in the uh, war of liberation and also in the establishment of the Turkish Republic. And for for many decades, they remained as the uh, um, well, the remained. Uh, not in power, but just next to power um, to maintain the, the basic pillars of the Turkish Republic. And uh, in doing that, they also did with the three different uh, open military coups, a uh, so-called uh, postmodern coup d'etat, and also a coup attempt, as we have seen very recently. Uh, uh, now, there are different uh, different images uh, of the Turkish military and their role into politics and also their role into the democratization process uh, in Turkey. Somebody see the, the Turkish military have, uh, has the, uh, more, well, a big power for modernizing power uh, uh, inside Turkey uh, and uh, others see it as actually just the opposite, one of the main uh, um, the main obstacles to the process of modernization uh, and process of mo democratization in Turkey. So, um, so it's very interesting to see uh, different aspects of um, civil military relations and also the relations between the military and the US. Yeah, uh, that is also a, a very hot topic today that we are continuously checking Twitter and new Twitters from Mr. Trump uh, about military operations uh, led uh, by Turkey. So uh, I will immediately stop here and then I will uh, uh, leave the floor to uh, Metin Gurjan, that is an uh, independent researcher and he also recently published uh, a, a very interesting book on the uh, on the Turkish military uh, and after uh, the 2016 coup. Uh, coup. Yeah, so please. Okay. 
First, uh, let me thank Sami personally and then the organizer uh, for uh, inviting me to uh, such a lovely and timely event. And it's my uh, privilege uh, to speak in front of such a um, distinguished audience. So we will be basically talking about Turkish military, which is currently fighting, uh, you know, in, in uh, north and northeast of Syria. So we are talking about a fighting military. This is a kind of uh, fighting military that we should always keep in mind. It has been a military that uh, it is the military that has been busy for almost two decades. You know, in the fight against terrorism, the terrorism of you know PKK, Kurdish separatist PKK, and also uh, Turkish military took part in uh, some uh, counter terror operations against you know, ISIS-inspired and ISIS-linked uh, group inside Turkey and uh, abroad. Uh, so uh, also uh, Turkish military has lots of uh, international uh, missions uh, contributing to the peace and stability in Afghanistan, uh, lots of uh, missions in Balkans, in Africa, and in some other, in Central Asia, and also in some other parts of the world. So we will be talking about the fighting military. So uh, I would say that uh, I am the walking example of Turkish uh, civil military relations because uh, at the age of 13, uh, as a uh, villager boy uh, living in a remote uh, place, in a remote village in central Anatolia, I applied to the military high school exams and then I won this exam, which was then a very, very important and hard exam. Uh, out of 40,000 people, I became one of those 800 lucky boys who, you know, uh, nailed this exam and put on his uniform at the age of 13. And uh, I took this, took off this uniform in 2015, after 25 years of service. So, um, Turkish military has turned into my subject matter in scholarly terms as well. So if you are dealing with uh, complexities and complicated issues related to militaries, then you, uh, methodologically speaking, you have three approaches. And the very first approach is, uh, is to consider a military as the uh, social research of outsiders, social research of others. So if you do not have an experience about the military to keep your neutrality and objectivity, you should treat it as your social research of others. Another approach should, uh, can be a social research of insider. So mine was a kind of social research of insider. So I started my PhD uh, in 2011 at Bilkent University uh, about Turkish military and military transformation uh, at the rank of captain when I was serving in the military. Uh, then it was my social research of insider. Then I decided to resign from the military in uh, late 2014 because of pursuing my academic career. Then I got an invitation from Oxford University. Uh, I was on the uh, brink of completing my dissertation. Uh, and after years of very you know, hard uh, services, then I decided to quit. Then after quitting, uh, I, of course, uh, continue writing my dissertation. That turned my uh, uh, academic uh, researches as social research of familiar. So uh, military was social research of insider during my military service. Then it turned into a social research of familiar uh, for me. So uh, as uh, said, uh, I wrote a book uh, about Turkish military. It's a kind of PhD dissertation turned book uh, trying to understand the complexities of the black box of Turkish military uh, and Turkish civil military relations, uh, a kind of comparative study, uh, you know, comparing uh, the post uh, July 15 military and Turkish civil military relations or CMR uh, and the pre July 15 military and uh, Turkish uh, CMR. Uh, in this uh, PhD dissertation uh, I, or PhD research, uh, I will be talking a little bit more about that in the following slides. But the main uh, overall question that I'm trying to understand is, uh, can militaries change and can Turkish military change? And uh, what about the transformation of Turkish military in the last decade uh, as a security actor in the field of security and then as a social institution? and then officership as a profession. 
So can militaries uh, change? And do we notice some changes within the military? And how those particularly, uh, ex not external, but internal factors having impact on this change within the military? So this was my overall uh, research uh, question. Okay, let me start my presentation. How can we start it? Okay, so the title of my presentation today is Opening the Black Box, Turkish, civil, Turkish Military and Civil Military Relations After uh, 2016 Coup Attempt. You know, as we know uh, that the deep-seated debate in general civil military relations or CMR literature revolves around the nature and characteristics of relationship between civilian and military world. So first, I should note that uh, in my conceptualization of CMR, uh, I mean civilian and military worlds, they are ontologically different worlds. So this is my conceptualization. So uh, I have a kind of approach of uh, military is from planet Mars and civilians are from planet uh, Venus. So uh, I also uh, ontologically think that uh, there is a kind of inherently existing gap between these two uh, planets. So uh, whole problematic for me is to manage uh, to these gaps between the civilian and the military worlds. And then I think this is a relevant conceptualization uh, when it comes to uh, understanding the CMRs in Muslim majority countries. So civilians are from Venus, uh, military is from Mars. So let's start with uh, basics, I say, ontological issues. Uh, what are those basic differences between the military and the civilian world? In contrast to the civilian world, military has a sense of self-awareness. So uh, this is important uh, because they are cherry-picked as you know, aristocrats and elites of their countries and educated accordingly. That I know from myself, as I said to you, I was a uh, you know very uh, how can I say unimportant trivial uh, peasantry you know a, a village boy. Then I went to the military high school at the age of 13, and they uh, after uh, being you know admitted to the military high school, they started to. to indoctrinate me uh, that you are the aristocrat, you are the elite of this society, and you will be the uh, one you know, um, having decision on the future of the state and the society. So this uh, sense of self-awareness we should keep in mind. And also, uh, so also we can discuss some details about the importance of professional military education. This is an important topic that we, maybe we should touch upon in our Q&A session, because this self-awareness is not a kind of given thing. Given thing. It is being uh, you know, uploaded to the minds of those cadets, military students, during this professional military education. And then it means that this education is also uh, a kind of example of emphasizing those military students that you are different. Huh? So also in contrast to the civilian world, the military is more organized uh, and professional procedures and discipline ena enabling them to act collectively. So in mass, uh, most of the Muslim majority countries, the militaries are the most organized and most professional bureaucratic institutions in those particular states. So we also should keep in this mind. And also professional ethos uh, meets you know, uh, the norms and values. They are uh, there waiting for you to be indoctrinated as a package. Uh, so military also means professional ethos and those means, you know, military parades, trainings, rituals, uh, and all those stuff. And then those professional ethos delivers uh, to the military personnel a kind of sense of singularity or unity or uh, split the core, we call it, team membership. You are a part of a team, you are a part of a very sophisticated bureaucratic machine, and you should act collectively. Obey, disobedience to the absolute orders is a kind of uh, uh, your uh, being betraying to the established norm and all these professional ethos and to the commanders and betrayal of to the collective whole. So also you should keep this in, your, in mind. And military is the only agent or monopole or hegemon on the use of state legitimized use of violence 
in a systemic fashion in a Weberian sense. So military is something directly related to the statehood. This is also very important. And there is a kind of direct relationship between statehood and state formation. Uh, let me uh, remind you, the uh, late uh, passed away, you know, uh, Professor Charles Tilley, you know, he has a famous uh, metaphor, uh, state makes war and war makes state. So war making activity, the things that military is, multi military is, uh, do, is directly related to the state and state formation. And as I said to you, as self aware institutions, militaries know that. So they are the guardians of the state, and in some cases, they are the guardians of the nation, particularly in the Turkish case. So uh, after you know, uh, talking a little bit about uh, modern militaries and their self-awareness about these issues, uh, here I'm coming with a kind of provocative question. Uh, why should those modern militaries, why should those soldiers care about fragmented, deceptive, unreliable, inferior, ill-disciplined and untrustable elected civilians and submit their full control because they are the ones carrying arms. Why do they do that? This is an important question, particularly very relevant to those Muslim majority countries. Why do militaries submit to the uh, control of those inferior, ill-disciplined, uh, deceptive, unreliable elected civilians? because they are the ones carrying arms, and if you are the one carrying arms, then you have an inherently existing rule to set the rules. To either to govern if you want, or either to rule if you want, so you are the one carrying arms. So uh, this is provocative questions imply a paradox for civilians. Uh, I was a, a soldier, but now I am a civilian, so this has become my paradox as well with you. Uh, because we fear others, we create an institution of violence to protect us, but then we fear the very institutions that we have created. So this is a kind of interesting paradox for civilians. Peter Fever, he calls this paradox as civil-military problematic. This is a civil-military problematic, implying the need for uh, receiving protection both uh, by the military and from the military. So this is a very interesting and uh, very good sentence that I like. I really like this kind of simplified way of expressing my ideas. So this is the civilian's paradox. How to create a kind of accommodative institutional framework or cage uh, to assure you uh, to get the, this protection both by the military and from the military. So this is the problematic. So regarding the questions of protection from the military, we have two paradigms helping us, but this hunting tenion and Janowitzian paradigms, uh, they are not so relevant to explain CMRs of Muslim majority countries. Uh, so what are those paradigms? Hunting tenion paradigm suggests for ma maintaining, and uh, you see, we have military world there, and we have civilian world there. Military world is a kind of black box. It's in a kind of black box. We don't know what's going on inside it. But civilian world we can talk about. And there is a gap between these two. These gaps are important. So what does hunting tenium paradigm say? Uh, it says that uh, maintaining and managing the gap between the military and the civilian world through professionalization. So he says, if you want to manage uh, this gap, then you should uh, do it through professionalization of uh, the military. So the more we professionalize the military through professional ethos, cohesiveness, discipline, and bureaucratic processes, the more they distance themselves from the coup. So this is the tacit assumption of Huntingtonian, you know, Huntingtonian paradigm. So the more we professionalize military, the more they keep themselves away from the coups. So his approach is like, you know, give those generals uh, some autonomy, some tanks, some aircrafts, uh, some toys to play, uh, and so as to make them happy and let them professionalize themselves. So give them a room, a maneuvering room for them to professionalize themselves. At the end of the day, this professionalization and those objective control mechanisms that these militaries should foster within their black box uh, will uh, create a kind of endogenous or internal internal uh, mechanism so as to keep civilians away from coups. 
But in this paradigm, uh, if a military stage is a, a coup, then it's not professional. So I really criticize Huntington paradigm here because it's a kind of tautology. So if a military uh, stage a coup, then it's not a professional military. A professional military does not stage, stage a coup, a kind of dualist and, uh, uh, approach that leads us to, to, uh, to a tautology. So that's why I think uh, this is not a kind of good explanatory paradigm when it comes to Muslim majority states because we have militaries staging coups. So Huntington paradigm does not tell much about this. Coming to the Genovesian paradigm on the hand, other hand, the uh, Genovesian uh, paradigm does not trust to the militaries and suggesting that military autonomy is dangerous, both for the military and the society, then he offers, uh, instead of managing the gap, uh, diminishing, uh, instead of managing the gap between military and the civilian, we should diminish the gap between the military and society so as to anchor military to the society as a whole. So the more military becomes the mere mirror of the society, then the more that military distance itself from the political intervention. Of course, Genovesian paradigm has a good exploratory power, particularly when it comes to the 1970s of United States. We have to contextualize it. You know, in 1970s of United States, uh, he come up with a kind of military sociological approach uh, so as to address this widening gap between the civilian world and military world. There is a kind of alienation uh, between these two because of, you know, some uh, leftist liberal uh, waves, but Cold War was going on. So he is uh, coming up with this solution of, to some extent, militarizing the society and to some extent, socializing the military. So simply Huntingtonian tradition with a kind of institutional twist examines how civil, uh, civilian political leaders can maintain civilian control. And Janovis, on the other hand, with a kind of sociological twist, concentrates more on the cultural norms, values, and societal factors affecting militaries and the relationship between the soldier and society. So uh, coming to my overall argument today about Turkish CMR, uh, I want to understand the, the pre-July 15 Turkish CMR and post-July 15 Turkish CMR. I want to argue that a hasty reform process that we witnessed after July 15 coup attempt, or for me, with a kind of much more sophisticated definition, it's a kind of typical military uprising for me. Not a coup attempt, but military uprising. I will uh, discuss this if you ask in our Q&A session, because it's a typical military uprising led by that uh, FETÖ, or we call it Gülenist cult, cult or Gülenist terror organization, uh, and Gülen inspired uh, officers. And uh, we can discuss about that. It's a typical military uprising for me. So uh, I uh, say that the hasty reform process that I call revolutionary civilization, revolutionary civilization at mass purges has picked up Turkish military from this Huntingtonian paradigm that I explained to you uh, to the uh, right back down to the Janovitsian paradigm. So civilian elites in Turkey have seen the attempted coup as a clear sign that military had been living in an, another world. This gap had been exploited by that Gülenist officers to hijack the military power. Military could not foster proper objective security mechanisms denying this hijack. And for civilian masters in Turkey, it's high time for the diminish the gap between the civilian world and the military so as to immediately anchor the military to the civilian world. So we see a kind of paradigmic shift uh, in this uh, pre and post uh, setting of Turkish uh, civil military relations. So military's uh, ending of autonomy and uh, independence of the military and exterminating this gap between the civilian and military world so as to keep uh, un military under a strict, very strict uh, civilian control. So uh, this is uh, the overall research question uh, in my academic research. Uh, I am not only concentrating on the civilian and democratic control, for me, as a military person, you know, I also care about operational effectiveness and operational efficiency of the military because Turkish military should be uh, like that. So I define operational effectiveness the degree to which reaching to the political objectives, you know, if elected civilians say something and set an objective, then military should have capacity to achieve it 
effectiveness is uh, that for me. And operational effect efficiency is, you know, uh, high outputs with uh, maximum outputs with minimum inputs in terms of time, money, personal resources. Uh, and also I can add international reputation. I really care about Turkish military's international reputation here. So operational effectiveness, operational efficiency, and international reputations are important in my understanding of CMR. I care about military. I don't want to kill this tree. But also, I care about civilian control, I care about democratic control, and I have to add something more here, that as a third pillar, I care about social legitimacy of the military, societal legitimacy. My understanding of civilian control does not necessarily mean democratic control. Some uh, you know, scholars, some journalists, some intellectuals in Turkey, they started to use civilian control interchangeably with democratic control in the post-July 15 setting. I think this is a strategic mistake. Civilian control does not necessarily, necessarily mean uh, uh, military control. May I ask a question to you? Which military in the world has the most or highest civilian control? China. Yes, good answer. China. China has, Chi Chinese military has the most or highest civilian control because all those generals serving in the Chinese military should be a member of Chinese Communist Party. And uh, at the battalion level, at the battalion level in Chinese military, we see party commissaires, party, party officials, uh, you know, checking the battalion commander uh, and uh, deciding on whether he is acting uh, directly upon the rules or objectives, political objectives of the uh, Communist Party or not. So civilian control is for me, is the transfer of political power from the military elites to the civilian elites. And this is not enough. I am not talking about transfer of power. And for Philip Schmitter, you know, security sector reform model, he says this is a first phase, first stage of healthy CMR. We don't only want transfer of uh, power from military elites to the civilian elites. We want democratization. We want, we want democratic control, meaning diffusion of this power among civilian stakeholders, like government, parliamentary, academia, think tanks, media, civil society. So we first want transfer of power uh, from military to the civilian elites, which implies civilization. And then we want diffuse of power among civilian stakeholders, uh, implying democratization, so as to create lots of check and balances within the system. Execution, executive office, governments should be checked and balanced with the parliamentary commissions. Media should say about something about CMR. Media should say about something defense policy making. Media even should say about something about military strategy making. Think tanks, academicians should talk about that. So that's why we can create many check and balances within the system for kind of healthy foster of uh, CMRs. So in my also approach, uh, so as for me to introduce in a scholarly fashion uh, to you, uh, this was my challenge in my PhD research. In Turkish CMR, we see civilian and military domain. And if you look at the uh, literature about Turkish civil military relations, only arrow one, the first arrow, and the second arrow, arrow two, are the ones addressed by the military, uh, addressed by the literature. So for the, uh, you know, uh, civil, uh, Turkish CMR literature, if you look at the literature starting from 1970s, Turkish military is monolithic, time-proof organization immune to change, it's a kind of black bus, so there are lots of given facts, you know, coming from the military. Uh, and then uh, the literature, uh, this is the critique, and this is the gap that I want to fill in the literature. There is a kind of inclination to explain all outcomes in Turkish CMRs through exogenous or external factors by concentrating on arrow one and arrow two. But in my research, I say that there is a kind of interesting things going on in the field of arrow three. So there is a kind of bidirectional relationship between the Turkish military, 
meaning that militaries can change and can uh, you know, uh, dictate its own reality to the CMR. Uh, and also, uh, there is a change uh, within the Turkish CMR, having uh, been impacted upon things going on inside the military. So the third arrow was my area of uh, focus. So, uh, of course, I should say something that uh, Turkish military has still been a black box. This is not civilian world's uh, blame or fault. This is the military's fault, like the other militaries of the Muslim majority countries. They like to stay within the black boxes uh, because, you know, secrecy, you know, secret things, you know, uh, and, and, and the military is, uh, uh, how can I say, uh, inclination to stay away from academia, to not to open themselves to the academia, and all these secrecy restrictions, they want to keep, uh, they, they, you know, uh, it helps them to keep themselves within these black boxes, but we should, I mean, as the civilians, uh, who are the masters of the militaries, and as I said in my understanding, civilian control is not a kind of given fact. You have to earn it through struggles. So. Civilians should be much more, how can I say, courageous, much more brave to earn this, this civilian control. So there is a kind of everlasting struggle between these two, uh, uh, opening the black box of military or not. So that's why military, uh, I mean, civilian world should be much more courageous. So uh, coming to my talk about Turkish CMR, of course, this is a very simplification of uh, the current, you know, uh, I mean, historical background. The, the Turkish CMR is much more complex than that, but I want to simplify things. So uh, in my understanding right now, there are mostly uh, three periods that we should, uh, you know, uh, talk about. Old paradigm, which is over after July 15 coup attempt that started in 1923 and uh, lasted to, in fact, to 2002 with the AKPs coming to the office as a single party government. So this is the old paradigm. And we have a kind of transitioning period that I can say AKP government's period starting from 2002 to 2016. And we have super presidency that started in 2016. So another, uh, maybe uh, at the end of the talk, I will be you know, uh, providing my insights about Kuovadis, what is next side of the story, but this uh, is simply uh, three uh, main uh, periodization of the military. Let's talk about old paradigm. And these are interesting pictures that I cherry picked for you. So this is the picture uh, from 1987, uh, uh, just before the initiation of higher military councils at the first week of August. It's a tradition, you know, uh, if you remember, I talk about professional ethos and, you know, traditions is important for the modern militaries. It's a tradition for the military to visit uh, Atatürk's uh, tomb in Ankara, that we called Anut Kabir. So uh, they first visited Atatürk's uh, tomb, they delivered their salute uh, to Atatürk, and then, uh, you know, re-emphasized their loyalty to Atatürk and his principles, and after that, they started their higher mi uh, military council meeting at the every first week of August. What are those military, uh, higher military councils do? They decide on the promotion and appointments of the generals. You see, in 1987 setting, just after the 1980 coup, can you see a civilian around? And then the guy uh, walking in front of alone, he is the you know, uh, then chief of general staff, Kenan Evren. Then uh, followingly he became the president and he's walking alone. Huh? You see? Nobody can walk with him because he is the master. And can you see civilians around? No. So this is the old paradigm. Starting from the early Republican period, 1923 till 1990s, we see Turkish military has been, uh, you know, Turkish military thinking and Turkish military has been designed uh, under the pillars of Prussian model, you know, Prussian model. I mean, territorial focus, land forces centric, inward looking, highly hierarchical, militarized and statistically oriented uh, focus. Uh, this, is, this focus prevailed in Turkish military thinking. So we see a kind of conflictual, conflictual period in this old paradigm, positivist, secular, pro-Western, military elites prioritizing, modernizing the country and overwhelmingly supported by the society against those, you know, as I said to you, unreliable, 
untrustable uh, elected civilians, uh, particularly, you know, uh, those uh, civilians, if they are from uh, reactionary political Islam or Kurdish separatism or have a kind of radical leftist movements, they are considered as internal threats to those, you know, uh, generals in this old paradigm. So if you are familiar with Samuel, uh, you know, Samuel Finer's a legendary book, The Man on Horseback, I highly advise you to read it. You know, it's a book really written, and a good, a very well written uh, book from 1964, I think, and The, Mon the Man on Horseback. And then he, it's a typical, uh, Turkish military is a typical example of his depiction of, uh, you know, a military with then deep interventionist mood, always looking for a motivation to exploit external opportunity structures, such as political instability, terror attacks, and economic crisis, so as to intervene in the daily routines of the politics. So, Turkish military in the old paradigm had a kind of, you know, uh, deeply interventionist mood, looking at, uh, looking for a motivation, so as to exploit, uh, exploit those external opportunity structures. So, when the civilian uh, politics get sick and uh, become uh, weakened then military is ready to take uh, the driver's seat, and society welcomes that. Because at the end of the day, the people in Turkey thought that at that time, all time, military, we have the military at the end of the day. They can take, take care of things. So also, uh, low external and high internal threat environment, you know, uh, contributed a lot uh, for military's consolidation of its power. So in my understanding, I also think that, and that will be a good topic for our, you know, uh, PhD uh, students and, you know, master students here. NATO's involvement, you know, pro-NATO stance of the military and in becoming a NATO member has contributed military to consolidate its uh, political power at the domestic front. So we have the Article 5 of NATO at the end of the day. No need to take care about external, you know, uh, threats. We are autopiloting everything about uh, when it comes to external threat. So we don't have, I mean, we have lots of time. Huh? <laughs> NATO is taking care of external threat environment. We have lots of time and we are ready. So instead of wasting our times by drinking teas and coffees, let's have a close look at the, the daily routines of uh, domestic politics. So NATO membership. I think asymmetrically, uh, at the end of today, of course, it's a good mechanism to democratize things in Turkey, but it, became, it made Turkish military much more inward looking and much more lazy. And also, it's because of NATO, I also criticize NATO here to some extent, uh, because of NATO that we couldn't uh, make a kind of cognitive military revolution. Cognitive military revolution. Turkish military cannot become an intellectual military because of NATO membership. Because all those way of thinking and doing things came from NATO. Our generals did not, you know, uh, struggle a lot to find a Turkish model, you know, uh, to uh, Turkish model for, uh, for Turkish civil military relations. Turkish model for you know, uh, CM, I mean, defense and security policy making and Turkish model for military strategic making. So this is the picture from uh, 2012, uh, 2012. You see, uh, we have two civilians here, Prime Minister, then Prime Minister Davutoglu, then uh, President of the Parliamentary, uh, uh, sorry, then uh, Defense Minister, uh, Vejdi Gönül, but the President, he's not around because there was a problem between him and the you know, military at that time in 2012. So this is a picture from this you know, transitioning period. In this transitioning period, uh, you know, if, if, if you look at the literature about uh, you know, Turkish military is becoming much more submissive to the uh, you know, civilian elites and civilian control, starting from 2002 till 2016, you, if you uh, do a good literature review, then you come up with, uh, you know, five different exponential approaches, you know? So it's uh, taming or that tamed, that tamed uh, the military uh, to fully, uh, you know, uh, submit uh, to the civilian control. So thanks to European Union candidacy process, and these organizational, uh, you know, structures, and I have to say that current president, Mr. Erdogan's, you know, personal 
uh, strong stance, his resilience to you know, fight against those generals in that transitional period, and high level of good support of AK Party. And uh, the um, AK Party's uninterrupted single party rule started in 2002 and still is strong. Uh, uh, we had so don't need civilian stakeholders. And you see Vice President trying to look at, because Mr. Erdogan is a little bit tall, and then he's a small guy, he wants to be seen, he has to be seen in this picture, and you see Chief of General Staff, General Yashar Güler, he is, he is mostly invisible. He is mostly invisible. Air Force Commander, he is good in shape, and you see Mr. Uh, Hulusi Akar, ex-Chief uh, of General Staff and new Defense Minister. He's proud. And then the new uh, guys, they are in a kind of, what am I doing here, kind of uh, 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 surprise uh, situation. OK. So OK. Uh, I'm, so Turkey's overarching dilemma after July 15 uh, whether to monopolize or democratize, uh, democratize CMR for more effective control of Turkish military. That's, you know, on the one hand, mono monopolization of CMR implies transfer of power from the military elites to the elected executive presidency. Uh, for, you know, pro-executive presidency circles, uh, for some, I think, they say, the most effective remedy for Turkey to diminish risk factor is to first formalize and then to institutionalize the executive presidency, the practical reality that has seemed to turn into an urgent need after July 15, then they suggest that lack of strong government was closely related with the fragmentation of the political parties as a result of uh, you know, uh, parliamentarism uh, and growing friction between the various identity groups, which led to the periods of instability in Turkey. And they said that we should consolidate executive presidency uh, so, uh, uh, lack of strong governments was closely related with the fragmentation of the political parties. And then, uh, for this consolidation, uh, we can uh, create a kind of very strict civilian uh, control. And also, we can create more effective oversight and monitoring systems over the military. And we can create very, very strong civilian check and balance mechanisms over the uh, military. So civilianization enough for us. So let's put all eggs into the basket of Mr. Erdogan's super presidency for a strong civilian control. But uh, I have some questions. Uh, you know, uh, will this monopolizing or accumulating power under an executive presidency enable stricter control of the state apparatus and democratizing power representing the better opinion in that it will create and check and balances 
institutional oversight, monitoring mechanisms within the state apparatus. I think these are still questions uh, lingering around, uh, despite the fact that we had almost, uh, we have been almost uh, three years uh, after July 15 uh, attempt. So, uh, Kuova side of the story, where to uh, go, you know, Still, we have uh, rivalries between the civilian and the military elites over the scores of scale tempo of military reforms. And also we see kind of lack of human, civilian human capital, which is very important. Despite the fact that civilian elites are very eager to take the control, uh, on the civilian side, we have still lack of human capital. It's also very important. Civilians, they do not know much about defense and security and military strategy, military strategy making. This is another minus. Uh, we have right now National Defense University, which is a good attempt, you know, a kind of civilian institution. But of course, uh, these kind of reforms, the, you can't do them overnight. You know, you have uh, years, maybe decades, for the consolidation of these reforms in the fields of defense and security and security architect. So Turkey has a lot to go. And also between the military, we have some uh, fights, pro status quo camp and reformist camp. Uh, some are saying that uh, we maybe should go back to our existing or old way of thinking and doing things. Some reformers, one are saying that, you know, we should go, uh, you know, beyond. And also we have some cliques within the military that I like to talk a lot about. Maybe in Q&A session I can explain it. You know, we have some Atlanticists within the military. We have some Eurasianists within the military. We have some conservatives and we have some neo-nationalists within the military at the higher echelons of the military, I mean at the senior uh, level. They have different, uh, you know, uh, way of conceptualizing the global and uh, regional security environment. And then they have kind of different, to some extent, conflicting political outlooks when it comes to Turkish military's role in Turkish CMR and then in, in internal and external uh, threats. And also we have a kind of rivalry between Air Force, uh, Army, Land Forces and uh, the Navy. You know, as I said to you, uh, Turkish military is a Prussian model. Land Force is dominating everything. But right now Navy and Air Force is saying that, okay, guy, your time is up. Right now we have another, uh, you know, we are on the brink of a military, you know, revolution here, you know, technology, military technology, we have lots of gadgets here, all, uh, you know, gadgets of the Navy and the Air Force. You should, you know, uh, maybe give up your uh, dominance or control uh, within the military. It's another one. And also we have problems between the officers and NCOs, we have problems between the junior uh, level, uh, we have problems at the junior level between the contracted surgeons and NCOs, and we have lots of systems. I and mean, Turkish military is trying to professionalize itself, trying to turn itself into a kind of full voluntary force, and conscription is getting weaker and weaker with every passing year. So these are the problems that I want to say. Cool, what is what is next? I don't have time. Let's discuss this in QA session. Thank you. Uh, thank oh, you. May, maybe, sir. Uh, I, I, can you? Uh, I want to uh, show you my book, you know, and, and, and some works that I do uh, for your more, you know. Uh, okay, okay then. Uh, at the Q and A session or after that, if you want to learn more about my book and some of my reports or some of the things that I wrote, I can share them with you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gurjan. Uh, a very interesting uh, presentation. Let's move immediately to uh, Assistant Professor Omar Aslan, that is uh, uh, at Ankara Yildirim Bayezid University. Uh, he will have a presentation on the role of the US and, and foreign policy in the civil military relations in Turkey. He also, please, uh, he also uh, has a recent book on uh, a similar topic. So thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Siga, for the, uh, the invitation, uh, this opportunity to speak in front of you. Um, well, I will talk about these external actors more uh, because for the last two, three days, it has been coming up, actually. I mean, we have been talking about domestic issue, domestic politics, domestic factors, uh, you know, from the army side, whether the civilians are supporting or inciting or calling the army to, to come and intervene. 
but as uh, I have been gathering from the, from the questions, asked to different speakers on different countries or from different countries, uh, that uh, we don't, uh, I mean, I think we lack in terms of the external actors and their involvement, what they do, uh, what kind of impact, impact they have on the uh, on civil military relations at large, particularly maybe on military coups as well. So I will talk about that in, in, in that aspect. But before I start talking about external actors, I will, I want to give you a bit of a background information uh, in that aspect, in that respect. Uh, I don't know if that's coming. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, I'll, I mean, first I'll start with the, this background, but then I, since, you know, I have been hearing uh, from uh, different academics and scholars and former ambassadors and diplomats about different cases in the MENA region, I would like to give you a bit of similarities uh, and differences, you know, between the Turkey and the, the other cases, because it will then, I think, make sense, you know, where the differences lie and where the similarities are. And then I will talk about external actors, but I would like to begin, when I come to that point, I would like to begin with a, with a distinction between motives and opportunity. Because to talk about, uh, especially military coups, uh, military uh, incursions into politics, I think it, it is better to distinguish between motives and opportunity, uh, or the need to intervene and then the ability to intervene. These are think, two different things. And then I will discuss the Turkish case in light of this distinction between the two, uh, between the two, this, between that, I mean, given that this distinction. I mean, of course, in the background, I, I will try to be very brief uh, in trying to talk about civil military relations in Turkey. Again, I'm starting from the Republican period, of course, I mean, what my colleague said about the, the army uh, of course, from the, from the late Ottoman times, is true, especially. I mean, the army is the first modernized and then goes and becomes the modernizer of the country, basically. So that is a, a good analysis because of the Ottoman realities in the, in the late, uh, let's say, 19th century and early 20th century. Uh, but when we go to the, I mean, the Atatürk era, let's say, when Atatürk was still alive, we don't talk about a democratic civil-military relations either. We are talking about an exceptional period of a very charismatic, the founder of the republic. We are talking about a civilian control, definitely, but that is not a democratic civilian control anyway. And I, I think none of us would expect a democratic civil military relations at the time. It is all about Atatürk and his charisma, the founders, the republican elite. They are basically unquestionable given, what they, given the feat that they accomplished with this war of liberation. As soon as he dies, and you know, Atatürk dies, passes away, then you see the army, I think, politicized almost immediately. So they are up in politics, discussing uh, uh, becoming a political actor in, in, in having a say about who is going to be the uh, chief of general staff, who is going to be the prime minister, and so on. So they, and you see already, I mean, if we, I mean, for those who are familiar with the, with the names, you know, Alparsan Turkesh, one of those who, who, is at the, who was at the forefront of 1960 coup, actually he read the coup memorandum on the radio. So he was one of those people, I mean, his politicization within the army began way back in, in late 1930s and early 1940s. So the army becomes immediately politicized right after Atatürk dies. So, so I think we need to know that the period uh, during which uh, the army was under civilian control when Atatürk was alive was a basically an exceptional period. As soon as he dies, the army becomes very much politicized in this, in this regard. So that's, uh, that's something to know. And it goes on. Then we have 1946 elections. There are some uh, people within the army, the officers, they want uh, the CHP, the Republican People's Party, to win the elections. Uh, but then the elections are not fair, are not really free. And then there are those others, I think they are still in the minority within the army. Then they don't like this. They don't like that the army, the, the elections is being, is, was being rigged. And that we see, I think, even more clearly when we go to 1950 elections. Because before 1950 elections, now we have a lot of memoirs written by these officers, so we know, I think, a bit more clearly that a lot of officers would just uh, hop on their motorcycles and then they would drive to the villages to ask for the villagers to vote for the, for the new Democrat Party. So they are very much actually propagating for the Democrat Party to win, and there are, of course, others who still are with, with Inanu. So they still want the Republican People's Party to win, but uh, I think a considerable number of officers within the army think that if uh, the, uh, the government 
they, if they rig the elections again in 1950, they are prepared to do something. You know, they are prepared to not allow this this time. So that, I think, again, shows a very good, in a very clear and succinct manner that, uh, you know, military was politicized in a, in a uh, you know, to a large, large extent. And we just know, I mean, we, we see them clearly intervening in the elections and having a say, actually. So then comes the Democrat Party, of course, 1950 elections, the first one, free, fair, multi-party elections. So they win the elections. Immediately afterwards, of course, we have this now coming and emerging NATO connection. Americans are more and more in. I will talk about this, the American involvement, because it goes back to a bit late 1940s as they inherit this, this role from the British, who, after the World War II, can no longer you know, take this burden of supporting the Greece and, and Turkey in this regard. So I will talk about more about, about this when I come to the external involvement, the external actors. But in 1950s, we have a military that is professionalized gradually. A lot of people, the officers, they go to the US for training. A lot of American advisors and teachers, they come and they teach uh, Turkish officers in Turkey. So we have a bit of a similar, not to the same extent, I think a similar um, thing going on with Pakistan eventually. I mean, they, they will become members in CENTO as you know, Turkey will. So the, the military education, professional education that we get, you know, is kind of similar to in this regard in 1950s. Uh, so a lot is going on. A lot is going on. It doesn't, I think. Oh. Sure. I mean, a lot is going on in terms of the military professionalization, but that doesn't, again, mean that the army is staying away from politics. As, again, the accounts differ. Some officers in their memoirs say that, you know, they began plotting as early as 1952, but many, I think, the, the, the larger consensus is, I think, 1954, 1955. So plots have been going on uh, within the, uh, plots have been going on within the, uh, within the army, basically. Of course, these are not very open, but, you know, there are those groups of officers who would like, who are, who are thinking about what to do, you know, where we are going for different reasons, and they have different grievances. We can maybe talk about them if you want to know more about these in the Q&A session, because I don't want to go into these, these details. Uh, so that goes on, of course, and then we have the first coup in 1960. It's a junior officer's coup, because the higher command is basically pro-government. I mean, they, they, are, they are with the government, basically. But the, the point, I think, made by the American ambassador in, in Ankara is, is very right. So he says that, you know, once the coup happens, he says that Pandora's box now is opened. So now from now on, you will see more and more military because now they, they took the first action, first step. From now on, it will be even easier for them to do these things. And the military will be even more politicized, and he is true. Then we have in 1962 and 63 two uh, coup plots. They, they failed eventually, but the army is boiling basically after 1960 coup. Uh, and the two coups failed is just uh, those that we know actually. But there is a lot of people, a former general even said that now, after 1960, everybody in the army is, is playing games of, you know, of overtaking the government. Everybody has their own dreams and plans and so on. So very much politicized army we have uh, after that. In 1960s, the, the, the left rises in a way because the Labour Party is now allowed to open. You know, they contest elections. They are even uh, able to get some seats in the assembly. They manage some sort of a limited success in the elections that, that will come up. And then the, the younger officers even get more politicized uh, in 1960s. So all the way there are different coup plots going to 1970. Uh, and then 1971, the high command, I think, uh, you know, steps in. Says, well, you know, we have to st put a stop to, to these efforts. So they do what I, you know, I think it's safe to, be, to call that a preventive coup. So we must prevent these younger officers to actually uh, overtake the, uh, the, 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 depose the government. Because in 1960, I think there is one legacy that the 1960 junior officer school had. And the legacy known to every single higher ranking general in the army was this. You cannot and we cannot allow the junior officers to take over again. Because when they do, it is all like... Uh, and, you know, the army is basically in chaos. You don't know what they are going to do. They are radical. Because when, I mean, with the higher command, I think they know their responsibilities in a, in a, you know, in a better way, I, I, I would 
I would say. So that's why I think 2016 coup attempt is more radicalized in, the, in a way that the higher command wouldn't do it in this, in this way. So they would be even more responsible, not in terms of take, not taking over, but in terms of how they would, they would manage the dynamics or different sort of calculations and so on. Then we have 1970s, again, the civil, I mean, the, 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 there's chaos in the streets, left and right clashes and so on. Uh, and, but in 1980 now, we had a hierarchical coup. Very much, uh, you know, smoothly done, uh, well planned for a long time. Uh, but that doesn't mean, of course, they don't take their precautions. I mean, they, they, they took their precautions in a, in a good way. 1997 coup, when we go to 1990s again, I mean, the, uh, the political Islamists are coming. Uh, so this is something like similar to Algeria, because you know, they, a, a, a presenter here, a speaker said, FIS, you know, was not expected. So the army did not have a scenario for them. Exactly the same thing. In 1990s, they are emerging, but the army doesn't have a scenario for them because they think that Islamists have been there for a long time now, for the last 30 years, if not more, but they haven't done anything much yet. I mean, they have been in coalition governments, uh, but now this time they, they emerge victorious in local elections, and then they do really great in the national elections, and that is like the army is freaked out. Of course, and something has to be done about, about these people. And then 1997 coup, dubbed the postmodern coup, but this is not the first time that postmodern coup was used. Because just, I think, a few months before, Abdullah Bukharam in Ecuador was deposed, and the, the economist had a title that said the postmodern coup. This is the, because now the, it's not the army at the forefront, but the, uh, I think their parliament is now voting him out of the, uh, out of the government. So this is not a very original you know, expression. And there is a huge debate between uh, observers of uh, civil military relations in Turkey. You know, who coined the term postmodern coup first? You know, I coined it. And the other says, oh, I coined it, as if this is like new. But this is not new. I mean, he was, it was used before. Uh, so just to give you a bit of a detail, more information, Early 2000s, now we have the AK Party government in power, but then the coup plus again continue again in early 2000s, I think. So, I mean, uh, immediately after 2002, nothing much changes. I mean, a lot has been going on. They, I mean, from my, my interviews with the former uh, you know, generals and maybe you know, lower ranking officers, uh, you know, everybody is aware that something is going on within the army, but there are three things I think that uh, prevented, they said, uh, that kind of a coup plot from materializing. One was the Europeans and especially Americans were against it. They didn't want any kind of coup at that time. The economic performance was there. The political will to some extent was there, but it wasn't huge. I mean, the a political will was there, but it wasn't a huge big factor because I remember very vividly Again, in, uh, just after AK Party government took the helm, uh, there was a sort of a clash bet between the army and the judiciary and the AK Party, and people would call Erdogan to say something like harsh, to take a like, harsher stance, and he would say, don't you remember 1997? You know, you cannot do these things immediately, so you have to be gradual in, you know, taking this up in a way. Political bill was there, but then it wasn't like, uh, you know, out uh, in the street fighting against this. And of course, the popular opinion. After 19, I mean, 99, you know, 2000, a huge economic crisis, people want a change. You'll see this from the, uh, from the basically major political parties are driven out of politics and now there's a new party, so people's expectations were high too. And so, uh, I mean, these were, I think, the two, three, four factors that prevented the coup in those years. And then we have, of course, despite all the arguments that coups finished in Turkey, I mean, you go back to 2008, 2009, 10, 11, everybody is writing, now there can no longer be a coup attempt in Turkey. You know, the, the generals are now submissive, and then you have 2000, 2016. And I think the only reason we can, I mean, the only reason we call this, or we can call this a military uprising is because we, know, we now know that it failed. If it succeeded, everybody would say a coup attempt. Right, because we didn't, we wouldn't know these are the Gulenists, and we wouldn't know because they were they were wearing the same uniforms, it's the army uniforms. They are out on the streets. They are doing things that looks like a coup, right? So the only reason that we can you know call this a military uprising now, I think, is just because uh, the you know it is uh, it, it failed. So if we had let's say in 1971 a, a coup done by junior officers would be by the leftist sort of minded you know, officers. Of course, they have things with cannibalism and so on. But would we call this a military uprising? So it's a coup attempt, right? I mean, in, 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 in the sense. But again, prevented in that year, definitely. So this is like a very short uh, sort of 
uh, background. But maybe two more things I can say about this. Uh, after every single coup, of course, I mean, the military takes precautions to, to prevent the, the politicians to do the same mistakes, quote unquote, I mean, in their own understanding. So in, in writing constitutions after 1960, 61 constitution, they will make sure that they put the politicians or the governments that will come into certain limits, I mean, red lines drawn for them. And the same happens after 1980 coup within 82 constitution. Now there's a National Security Council being implemented. So in the National Security Council, the army will have a say about foreign affairs and so on. So the powers of the president will be widened so that he will have a check over what the politicians do. And then there is a 10% electoral threshold so that small parties will not be in the parliament and they will make a mess. So they will be prevented from making a mess in the, in the, in the country in this, in this sense. Uh, so this you know, transition from military tutelage in, 2000, in, in those years, in that decade, and I think these are pretty much the, the, the factors too. I mean, they, all, they prevented coups in those years, or coup plots, but they, they also contributed to this, uh, I think, the, the, the transition. And the rhetorical, the rhetorical entrapment, maybe I can open this up if you, if you ask me in the Q&A session uh, in that regard. I mean, similarities and differences. I mean, Turkish army, again, is a guardian uh, army, a guardian of the republic, the principle of secularism. And this culture is transmitted from generation to generation through schools, right? I mean, in schools, the officers would know that, you know, they, some of them in the future, like before, will go and become the president, you know, very likely, so that, you know, they know that uh, they will have a say in politics, definitely through that. And then a former general would tell me that, you know, in, in, in uh, army colleges, you start from physical threats, and then this gradually changes and everything becomes a threat. From economic collapse, cultural imperialism, if those become threats, then you have to watch. And then you have to watch over what is going on in every single field, and that makes it, I mean, makes domestic issues uh, sort of threats too. Politicians versus officers are very much similar. Uh, politicians are uh, corrupt, uh, they are after their selfish interests, they don't look for national interest. Uh, they are just, they would always argue for nothing between themselves, would not make good or crucial decisions. But the army is disciplined, uh, not corrupt, and so on. And they would always look for the national interest. So guided democracy, you know, we don't, we are not yet ready for a full democracy. You know, it, is, it has to be guided, and the guiders, uh, guidance should come from these the army, judiciary, and all these tutelary sort of uh, organs and the actors. So you cannot allow people uh, unchecked, or you cannot allow, uh, I mean, let uh, the politicians unchecked, because it's easy to manipulate the masses. Uh, weak politicians, again, there is maybe the endogenate problem. <laughs> are they weak because of coups, or I mean, the coups happen because they are weak, but they are definitely weak. I mean, in 1980 coup, when that coup happens in 1980, Demirel has a, of course, after the coup, after some years pass, he has a, he's an interview with a journal, journalist, and journalist asks him, you know, didn't you think about resisting, even for a minute? And he says, how would I resist the, the Turkish army? Right, I mean, he, you know, when they do something, you just buckle and then go back, and whether they put you in prison or they send you away, just you do that. I mean, there's no other way. Of course, I mean, there is a good reason for this, because in 1960, these guys are not joking. I mean, they hanged two or I mean, three elected people, uh, a former uh, prime minister. So these guys, I mean, this, they're not joking. I mean, you, they're serious. So that acting, I think, is a big factor to, uh, for them, for the politicians to be weak. Uh, opposition used army in, the, in Turkey too. So civilian politicians or they said trade unions at times, they called the army to do something. They cooperate with them. That happened in 1980. So a lot of letters would be sent to Evren you know, to do something, to, to come in and take over. 1997, I think, is the same. Corporate interests, I think, matter in Turkey, but not to the extent that the Egyptian, it matters for the Egyptian army or the Pakistani army, perhaps. Because in Turkey, I mean, retired generals, they, they, are, they were employed in, in company boards and so on, but these are like individual things that happened after 1997 coup, but they don't have universities, they don't have army public schools, they don't have think tanks, uh, they don't have newspapers. Of course, they cooperated with them, but that is different from you know, owning them in, in a sense. Uh, they have like economic, uh, I think, uh, companies like Jiaosu we have, I think. It's uh, Gendarmerie Foundation owns it, but I don't think it is very widely you know, consumed anyway. So we have so many civilian 
I think better tasting, uh, you know, water that, you know, not many people, are, I think, use it even to that extent. So it, the Turkish army is a popular Praetorian army. It's popular in the sense that it had huge Turk, I mean, popular support, uh, enjoyed by the, uh, it enjoyed you know, from the people, uh, but it is a guardian army in the sense that they would like to intervene, come in, protect the secularism and the republican uh, principles and so on. They haven't rigged elections, but they have engaged in very clumsy political engineering in 1990s especially when the Islamists are now coming and they won local elections and then they did very well on the general elections. So they put together, for instance, a coalition government in 1996, but the coalition government just lasted for three months, basically, because it was like very much artificial, concocted. It wouldn't even live. So they did this, but it wasn't very much, uh, I think, good engineering anyway, but they tried their best, I think, and in, in these circumstances. Of course, they monitored, especially in 1990s, they, they would monitor universities, national media, business groups, and NGOs to actually uh, work with the like-minded civilian elites, uh, allies, but they haven't rigged, to my knowledge, I mean, they haven't rigged elections uh, in that sense. So there is a democratic tradition, I think that makes it the easiest with the Turkish armed forces. Because um, democratic tradition, by the way, is, is something that coined by, was coined by the American advisors in Turkey at the time. So they, the Turkish army goes back to democracy fast in a couple of years. So they, they, that's again a, a legacy, I think, from the, from the Republican times. You know, the Ataturk and the Republican elite chose democracy, so we cannot go back from it. So that dedication is there and definitely has to be there. And, but democracy is a lot more entrenched in Turkey anyway. So between this motives and opportunity, I mean, uh, from the other presentations the days before, we have seen that uh, political culture can be a motive, you know, weak civilian politicians perhaps can be a motive. So there are all these different corporate interests can be another, but I think we have to distinguish between motives and opportunity in this regard. I think to me, popular support is not a motive. I mean, no army would just go and take over the, the, the government just because they have or they enjoy popular support. There has to be other things. The same goes for, uh, I mean, organizational culture. It's a motive, but it's not an opportunity, I think, in this regard. Organizational culture may, be, may make it possible, you know, thinkable to intervene in politics, but there has to be other opportunity factors for, for the army to come in and do these things. And in this sense, I take the external environment, external actors to, to consideration, because external actors allow the militaries to come in. They present a good opportunity at times. I'm not saying that without such opportunity, they don't ever take over. They do sometimes, but uh, I think Turkish army is not one of these armies, I would say. Even the junior officer school in 1960, these people are not stupid. I mean, when they, ta they, when they take over, they know that we have NATO alliance. They know that we have American connection. They know that some of them are, I think, leftist minded. They don't like the, being dependent so much on the US. And so they want to break free of that kind of dependence, uh, but in the end they are pretty much realist. So they have to do something to, to work with the Americans to make sure that uh, they will not put aside NATO uh, links, they will not put aside being on the West or something. So they, they do uh, take in that into consideration, even when uh, they, they are junior officers, basically. So external actors influence coups as well as uh, the quality or the nature of civil military relations. Uh, let me pass this and, you know, if you want, I can go to this. So I think in two aspects we can take the, the external actors. One is shaping the organizational structure of the military. And that was taken, inherited from the British. In late 1940s, the American advisor missions come in, so they start working with the Air Force in a, in a big way, because World War II is a, you know, Air Force, Air Power now is big, is big thing. You must have this, in, especially to prevent, I mean, to protect the, the Straits, the, the Bosporus. So that uh, was the American advisors come in and they put a big emphasis on Turkish Air Force. So they do a organizational structuring of the army. They put the Air Force land and the, the Air Force, uh, the, the, uh, the, the Navy on the same level, because the Air Force was below these two other forces before. Uh, but the request, I mean, I'm not going to go and be conspiratorial. I mean, it's not that Americans come in and push that kind of organizational restructuring. The, the demand comes from the Turkish side. The demand comes from the Turkish side with the blessing of Inanu. Can you not please do something about our Air Force? Because everybody knows that Air Force is a joke. Uh, so they, uh, Americans are surprised. Do you really want us to come in and like, restructure the, the organizational shape of the army? 
And then they write back to Washington saying that this is a big opportunity. Washington says, of course, I mean, jump in. You know, jump in and do it, and they do. So that is, I think, one aspect of that kind of... So, I mean, everything else true, of course. Whatever manuals Turkish army had at the time translated from, the, from English, all the anti-guerrilla operations and all the manuals are translated, airfields are being built, roads are being built, so Americans are coming back. And the Turkish side, I think, is all happy. I mean, there is no other... I mean, there will be rejections after a while, like uh, gradually, but it, it is big in the sense. And the U.S. role about, because maybe two, three, sec uh, three minutes, I can uh, say a bit about this. Maybe we can, again, classify this into, into four. There are those coups maybe green-lighted by the Americans. I mean, the Americans have advanced knowledge about them. They are okay with it, and they encourage you know, that they should be done. So 71 coup is very much. I mean, the CIA uh, station chief in, 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 Ankara, in Istanbul, I think. So he says in his memoirs very much, you know, we knew what was going to happen, and we wanted that to happen, because then the radical leftist junior officers would take over. So it was very much in the, in, in the I mean, they had the advanced knowledge. AD coup, definitely, this is a hierarchical coup. Uh, all along, I mean, the, the army is very much in contact with NATO allies, Americans in meetings and so on, and now we know for sure that they knew and it was all okay. And they give the full package of this assistance, diplomatic, political, military, economic. 1997 coup is a bit uh, complicated, but I mean, it is green-lighted, but for a long time it was not green-lighted. Because in 1997, as we come to that period, the Americans are doing a lot of democracy promotion. They don't want a hard military coup like they approved during the Cold War. They want a different kind of a coup, and then the Turkish army becomes very much creative to work with the civilian allies for a long time to pressure, to put pressure on the civilian government. And the civilian government at the end has no choice but to resign. So that is, I think, a but in the end, I mean, they, they approve it for different reasons, for foreign policy reasons. And there are those, they want to work with the new government, like 1960, they are ambivalent in 2016, I would say, and there's a very bad reaction by, given by uh, Secretary of State John Kerry. He says that, you know, just as the coup is going on in full motion, he says they want stability in Turkey, and that is a bad word. <laughs> because stability can be provided by anybody. Like it could be the army, it could be the government, so whoever wins, you know, they will just go with it, I think, at the time. Uh, and then 62, 63, I think the Americans rejected those coups because the guy was a not case. I mean, the, the guy was, had been involved in these in, in many ways, so it wasn't something who you could trust. Final foreign policy, I can say maybe, do I have one minute? I know, do I have two minutes maybe? Okay. I mean, the foreign policy, of course, matters when it comes to the external involvement in civil military relations. Obviously, the armed forces were seen, the military in Turkey, I mean, they were seen as the linchpin of this Western orientation. The politicians are fickle. You know, to get elected, they can do funny things, they can waver, uh, they can try to play different uh, dynamics, they can go to left, they can do everything. But in the end, if you have the army as a safety valve, then everything is, you know, you don't have to worry about what the politicians do in the end. And that was very visible in 1970s when Bülent Ecevit, you know, this guy, he translated Indian, Indian uh, poems, uh, you know, he's on the left a bit, he wants to make Turkey less dependent on the, on the US and the West, the Cyprus happens, the American sanctions come in, so he and his ministers are talking about maybe Turkey may, can make it like a little bit of a change to, to the other side, or maybe become, you know, not, let's say, not as aligned as it was, and it just the, the Americans, of course, know about these, hear about these statements, and they talk to the Turkish general staff, the, the higher ranking generals, and the generals tell them, you know, this guy is just nonsense, and don't pay attention to him, right? I mean, in the end, because they, they call the shots, they know they're very confident in themselves. Uh, I think 1990s is a good example. Of course, many examples can be given on, on this foreign policy, how it affects uh, the civil military relations in Turkey, but 1990s, again, this is the context of 1997 coup. When, of course, Erbakan was a realist, I think, when he first came in, and when he wanted to approve Operation Provide Comfort, like um, approve in a sense that supported in the Turkish Assembly, Americans were okay. So for a, for a bit of a time, they wanted to see how this thing can go with the Islamists. So they want to try this out. And in the first, Erbakan plays all the cards right, but in the end, of course, he does, and in that period, when Erbakan plays cards right, uh, again, we have, we know very well from the memoirs now, the, um, the Turkish officers, just every single time they're in contact with the Americans, they go and ask them, do you want us to be the next Iran? What are you waiting? Right? I mean, do something about this, and then they don't. 
So they are very much frustrated, but then in the end, of course, Israeli lobby comes in, uh, a lot of visits, I think, to the Turkish general staff paid, uh, and eventually Americans, especially Arabakan, moves to have good relations with the larger Muslim world. You know, D8 is there, and then you see he goes to Iran, I think Libya, and then the Americans change their minds pretty much. You know, he, this guy, you know, we thought that he would play nice, but he's, you know, going maybe to the other side. The Turkish side can do a coup still. So, I mean, the, the, the objective is to, uh, to look like a constitutional coup. Nothing extra legal, nothing illegal, nothing unconstitutional. And that was done very beautifully in quote unquote by, in 1997. And uh, again, I mean, maybe we can talk about this 2000 and how foreign policy affected uh, the civil military relations in Turkey in that period. I don't want to take a lot of time. And that's the uh, part that I didn't forget. <laughs> the, the book that I, again, my dissertation, added one chapter, so it's now published. Uh, uh, it's about uh, you know, US involvement in military coups in Turkey and Pakistan during the Cold War, not after the Cold War. Uh, so I mean, thank you for listening. And uh, any questions? Uh, yeah. OK, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Aslan. Um, now, I, I, benefit, I benefit a lot from both of the, the speakers, uh, but I will. Uh, yeah, I will take some questions first, and then I will also make a couple of, of questions myself. Yeah, let, shall we start from? Okay, thank you. I have two short questions. One is empirical, the second one is theoretical. The first one I would like to ask the first speaker on the Israeli and Turkish relationship. I, I pick up one fact. I, pe I pick up the, the Gaza flotilla read from Israeli in 2010. It was international diplomatic you know, crisis. And as we all know, and you have already mentioned, Turkey is full member of NATO. Why Turkey did not put into practice Article 5 that you have mentioned? Maybe this crisis and rebel and disclose the good relationship between, between Turkey and Israel to the detriment of the Palestinians. The second question is, could you please elaborate why Turkey, in comparison to Egypt, its model has succeeded? Although they have, you know, Turkey and Egypt, they have a lot of things in common, such as history, the geography, the population, and so on. Why, why the, from the economical level, Turkey has very, very high economic growth. The political you know, process in Turkey has been fair, relatively speaking. In Egypt, we don't have at all political process. Elections have been really corrupted. The economic growth in Egypt is below zero. How could we explain this? The third question, if you allow me. You said two. They are in the inter interlinked. <laughs> the, th the third, I think it, it is very important for at least for the students that are here, you know. The speaker, you know, make a really strong call to the new Samuel, Samuel Hankton theory. I, I would say the whole departmentalist, you know, theories of the 60s and 70s. To recall all these theories, you know, their purpose is to, to, to justify 
strong military power are at the detriment of democracy in our country. For instance, all this theory did not predict any big events that had shaped international politics. I can give you an example. For instance, in 1979, uh, I didn't predict the, the, uh, the Khomeini, Khomeini revolution. I don't uh, predict uh, uh, neither the, uh, the fall of the, uh, of the Berlin War, neither the, uh, uh, the fall of communists, or in, in, in the 90s, the, uh, why I would say the theorist no event, or most, most recently the Arab Spring. I think uh, like this theory have been total failure. And I don't understand Myself, even when I was stood at this time, you know, I was really sick of these theories because it did help me to understand what is going on on the real, you know, uh, on the terrain. Thank you. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I have a question for Dr. Omar about. Um, uh, do you think that the Russian had a role uh, in, in against the, the coup in, in the last coup in Turkey? Uh, because I see there is uh, an interest, uh, especially the oil oil file, and also uh, the repositioning of geopolitical in uh, in Syria and, and other countries. So uh, and also we can see how the relationship between Turkey and Russia in future is growth up. Uh, against the, um, the NATO and the... So this is just a question. Thank you. Two more questions. Yes. Uh, actually, in the back. The first one. Assalamu alaikum. I have two questions. First one is for Dr. Mitten. Uh, don't you think we should change the way they teach uh, young soldiers and officers in the army universities? Like they should teach them they are equals to the people, they are not the elites or the aristocrats or the royal like they teach them in Egypt. Uh, my second question is uh, for Dr. Omar Aslan. What do you think about the coup in Egypt? Because I don't think there is a specific reason behind it. Thank you. We have two more questions from the gentleman with the, with the and then there is another one there. Yeah? Thank you and very then, much. Uh, actually, my question is to Dr. Metin. It's regarding like, the previous question regarding the education, uh, the, the literature that they educate to the, the, the soldiers over there, and also the propaganda industry that they run to manipulate the civilians, that if you want protection, only the, the soldiers, the army can protect you. So how to counter? I'm the media student. So how to counter and how to work in this regard? Thank you. So. Yeah. Okay, Please. thank you. Um, my question is to Dr. Aslan. Um, uh, regarding that in 2016 we had a coup, um, that shows that the relationship hasn't developed a lot. The military still thinks that he's the guardian of the country and he has responsibility to change its politics when it goes off the route that he thinks about it. So that's my first question. Have it developed or not? The second one, uh, defeating the coup have seemed like it's an intelligence win more than a civilian win. So uh, does that mean that the politicians in Turkey have depended on uh, developing intelligence rather than de uh, developing the relationship between military and civilians? Is that the case? Or why was, was it Fedan's win? And some paper says. Thank you very much. Very quick two questions, excellent presentations. Uh, on, the, on the issue of doctrine, what is the military doctrine of the, of the Turkish army? For the first 80 years, it was perceiving itself as the defender of the Kemalist principles or secularism. What is it now? Has it changed and to what? And secondly, what is the argument of having more than one uh, military officer in the National Security Council? Why do we need several? 
I mean, if all of them represent one institution, uh, that reform, you know, if you look at the National Security Council of the United States, for instance, you have one military officer, the chief of staff, and then you have security, CIA and others. What is the argument of having all the staff, all the member staff in the National Security Council? Then, I'll ask one. then we do another tour, yeah? Uh, thank you for the panelists. My question uh, for uh, Mitin. Uh, do, you, do you see any signals for uh, probably a return for the uh, army on the horse, you know, riding the horse again. I have in mind, for example, the uh, the, the actual government uh, used the uh, European Union as a leverage you know, to control or to reduce the, um, the influence of the army. And uh, also, you know, the legitimacy of uh, economic legitimacy, that means the growth now, you know, we, Turkey is facing uh, uh, slowdown in growth. And also, you know, the, the unity of the, the party, you know, our party faces a crisis. So we have, we have a different, and the relation now with the, with the NATO is, uh, is a bad one, yeah? So do you think, and do, uh, now Turkey is in a war, you know, in a different front, and the, this is, you know, I think that initiative for the army to come back. Do you think that it's, you know, uh, Turkey is in, complete shift from the military regime or maybe, you know, do we come back? Uh, because, you know, the site is polarized and what I uh, mentioned, you know, before. Thank you. Okay, let, let's start this time from uh, Omar Aslan. Yeah, we have many questions. Okay. Um, okay, can, you can hear me, right? Uh, the, I think the first question, I mean, the, if I didn't get it uh, wrong, uh, uh, Dr. Rashid uh, asked about Turkey-Egyptian relations and why they are not good, but uh, I'm not sure if he was asking it to me. So I will just dodge this <laughs> and go to Russian role in 2016. I think Russian role, again, I mean, it is impossible to know. There are all the claims. And role, I mean, in terms of, I think, positive, like warning uh, the Turkish side that something may happen or is happening and uh, you know, take your precautions type of thing. Uh, but uh, I think the post coup, all these remarks are just uh, to take advantage of the situation of the emerging rift between the U.S. or the West and the and then Turkey, because I think this was a for, for from the Russian side, it's a God sent opportunity that you take advantage of this by saying that you know the West has been, and again post coup, the obvious. I mean, when a coup happens, if you have the government and you manage to let's say, um, you know, the coup failed, uh, whether you did something or something else happened or where they were maybe, you know, not good uh, coup makers, uh, the, one of the first things that you as a government expect is to, to diplomatic visits, whether your allies really pay you visits in this regard. If the coup succeeded, the same would be expected by the coup makers, right? If you, because if you think about this, I, after 1980 coup in Turkey, this is a hierarchical coup. There is no opposition inside Turkey. Everybody is, is pretty much happy that the coup happened. Not everybody, but you know, let's say that um, there is no popular resistance. Even then, the coup makers are expecting very high-level visible visits to gain some legitimacy. So this is expected. This was expected by the Turkish government, and this was not coming. The European capitals, the Americans, they were not really giving this, and I told you already about the stability. So given this emerging sort of suspicion, the Russians, I think, wanted to take advantage of this kind of rift. And it, is, it has been going on, of course, with the other areas. I think the Syria is the last example that is going on. Well, Egypt 2013 coup, why it happened? I think it is, uh, that's the question, right? Why it happened? I mean, it is clear, I think, it, it, it's a counter-revolutionary move. We don't want to, it is sort of a, to, to basically preempt a big uh, transformational change in Egypt. And it is basically, the opportunity is there too, not only in terms of having, you know, being able to have the people on the streets as if, and with the slogan that army and the people are one, uh, this gives you a bit of opportunity, but then also regional actors are there, the global actors are there, so you know that they will be supporting this, and they, you have the motive, I think. The corporate interests, definitely, you know, you don't want to lose that in, in at large. You don't want to lose the army's uh, very big role in politics. You know, we have been talking about this for the last few days, and it's a basically a counter-revolutionary move to keep things uh, in control in this regard, so I think it is pretty clear. I mean, they had ample reasons, not understandable from our side, but from their side, I think it is very much clear. Uh, 2016, 
I mean, I definitely agree with you. If you, I mean, from the uh, basically start of the, the AK Party government, uh, for, I mean, in certain episodes, people would just write and say that there is now, again, I told you about this. I mean, the coup, no more coups in Turkey. Everybody was just propagating that the coup cannot happen, the army is now surrendering and so on. As if there is, I mean, the, 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 as if there is trust between the, the army and the, the government. But I think there was little uh, trust for a long time, all the way until I would say 2011, 2012. And then, of course, we had the other dynamic, that's the, this Gülenist, this officers coming in. Uh, and the important thing is, I mean, it was led by Gülenists, the coup, but there was many others who actually bandwagoned or joined because they didn't think that this was done by them. At the moment, and this is a coup, it's a huge thing, is in full motion. Nobody knows who's in charge. Nobody knows whether the chief of general staff is alive or he is charged, or whether he is leading this. For a long time, they didn't know, I think. So a lot of people, I mean, within the army, they're joining in because they thought that this was a Kemalist coup, right? So, I mean, that shows you us, I think, apart from the Gulenists, a lot of the big factions within the army, they did not have trust in the government. So they did not like the government, they wanted the government to change, and there was a lot of, I think, again, opportunity factors, given the deal with the, or the negotiations with the PKK collapsed, the regionally Arab Spring, Turkey is not wanted by anybody, liked by anybody. If that collapses, maybe there's a big opening in the Syrian Arab Spring front, a, a sort of a revolutionary, again, you may debate this, but a sort of a revolutionary front, again, collapsed. And it's a huge boon for everybody regionally and globally, international too. I think there was little trust. But for after 2016, is there trust? From the government side, I think there is little trust. I cannot talk about from, from, the, from the army side because I think it has been in transition. Uh, there are factions, you know, as my colleague said, I think. Uh, some of these factions, I think they have their distrust against the government, but we don't know how big these factions are, what is the balance between them. But from the government side, I think there is little trust. I mean, that's, and there should, they should have little trust. I mean, it's just three years ago, you had a coup attempt that just failed. So you can see, I think, this distrust from the fact that now the intelligence, I think, is all over the army. Now they're watching over what is going on as much as they can. I don't know their capabilities. And the other question, whether this was an intelligence you know, success, or, I mean, or whether this was a people's I mean, success in this regard, I think it was, uh, well, intelligence had a big thing going on. I think to, I mean, maybe I can give you a couple of examples. Uh, a lot of strategic moves were made during the coup, as the coup was still in motion. One was, I think, around 1 a.m. on the night of the coup. The, uh, the intelligence, I think, is very much in contact with the media people and everybody is saying, and I think the government side is also saying, was also saying, that now the coup is suppressed. It's finished. Though everybody knew, I mean, if you just follow the news, it, just, it was ongoing. I mean, maybe one front was suppressed, but it was still ongoing. So that was a information control. So the, the media is, I mean, the, 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 the TV channels are on, everybody could have, get the news of what is going on. I think it was a very strategic move in the sense that if you tell people that it is finished, it is suppressed, uh, then, uh, again, look at it from the, from the cool maker side or the army side. A lot of officers are waiting on the fences. Do you want to go in with the cool makers? Do you want to stand back? If you go in with the cool makers and it fails, you are doomed. If you uh, don't go in, but the coup succeeds, you, you are doomed again. So you wait on the fences for more information, and no more information is not coming in from the army. Uh, it doesn't come from the army because, again, those, uh, the, the generals, especially from the gendarmerie, I think they're on the forefront of coup resistance, they were so smart. The guy connects to TV channels and says that, uh, you know, we, are under con we, we have this thing, this thing under control, the army as a whole is not behind this. So that information goes to those who are waiting on the fences. But at the same time, this guy, we know this of course from after the, after the coup failed, this guy, this gendarmerie, I think he's now the, 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 the commander of the gendarmerie. He was on the forefront and everybody, all those on waiting on the fences, they are calling him to ask for, let's say, the, the, the commander at the time, and the commander is under detention. I mean, the, the coup makers de detained him. But he doesn't say that the, the coup makers detained the general. He says the general is busy right now, he cannot talk to you, he is busy with organizing resistance. Beautiful information control. So everybody thinks that the, the gendarmerie commander is actually around, he's busy, 
So if he's in control, then it's all about this command chain, right? I mean, this is a very, uh, I mean, the legalist army that is, I think, we have in the Turkish Armed Forces, there is a command chain. And there are many more such examples of information control. This, is, this was, I think, very big. But this was that part done by this, this commander and the people around him was not an intelligence thing. You know, he was just smart, I think. Uh, well, the information that I have. I mean, I don't know whether he was talking to intelligence, but I wouldn't imagine that he would have time to, you know, get information, guidance from the intelligence, you know, do this, do that, and so on. So that was, I think, uh, I mean, a lot of people, of course, mattered, I wouldn't say. But one thing I would warn is that a lot of people now praise the police. You know, they were very instrumental in suppressing the coup. Not that much. You know, a lot of them were begging for heavier weaponry and so on because they were helpless in front of the tanks and the help was not coming. So they did a resistance. They put people and you know, they collected people from the streets. They put them in certain locations. They were instrumental. But, it, you know, if it was the army in command chain, the coup, they would just run away from anybody. So, I mean, just, you know, they, they could. But then, of course, what comes after is something moot. You know, we don't know. But then, uh, you know, it's just uh, the police wasn't there that much. I think the people, too, I mean, they were very instrumental and so on. But in many cases, I would just bring it to your attention, the people would try to resist the wrong guys in the streets because everybody was wearing the same uniform. <laughs> so everybody looked the same to them. Sometimes, I mean, this is, again, from the after the coup, all these testimonies they would stop the wrong people on the streets. Those resistors would be stopped by the people thinking that they are coup makers. So people, I mean, they were doing things, they were very instrumental. They were instrumental in the sense that the, I think one thing that the army was very much afraid and all armed forces, I think, are very much afraid is uh, civil war. So what if there's a civil war? There are those people who are you know, with the coup makers and there are those who resist. So they give this kind of, they scare the, the army, I think. You know, if we do this, you know, kill more people, then there could be, uh, a, a civil war. Having more than one general, I think it is about the, the, the balance of forces, I think. Uh, so if we had more generals before the National Security Council, they would have more say, more clout in the, in the National Security Council about the issues that matter to them. But if you reduce their number to one, I think he can still bring to forth the military expertise and advice on different issues, which is fine, you know, which is what you want. Because you want the military to give you advice about the security issues because they understand these issues better than anybody. But to have them all of you know, different uh, gendarmerie, land forces, navy, and uh, others before was about you know, to, to control the rest, the civilians, basically. That's what I, that's what I think uh, the, in terms of that. Military doctrine, I think I better leave that question to my colleague. I think he, is, you know, he knows the, the, the doctrine and everything is bet better, I think. Yeah, thanks. Please. So, let me start with the last and the most dangerous question. Uh, signals uh, from the army about uh, another, maybe, uh, or forthcoming coup. Uh, uh, to answer these questions, I want to give uh, some insights about the current state of civil military relations. Um, current state, if you look at the civilian side of the story, we have, as I said to you, Super President Mr. Erdogan. And in the civilian side, I mean, military side, we have ex-chief of general staff and new defense minister, Hulusi Akar. So if you want me to define uh, the current uh, nature of uh, uh, civil military relations in Turkey, I will say that it's, it has get narrowed, uh, narrowed to an extent that it has become a kind of personalized relationship between Mr. Erdogan and Mr. Akar. So per personal harmony between these two guys is extremely important. And if you get if you get one of these two guys out of the system, then I don't know uh, what uh, could be the outcome. So extremely personalized uh, way of thinking and doing things, and this personal trust and harmony between these two guys, meaning that the new uh, stage, uh, the new uh, model that we are right now trying to understand is, has not still been institutionalized. And I would say that to uh, Mr. Ar Mr. Akar, the ex-chief of general staff and the new defense minister, he seemingly has a full control over the uh, military, particularly his relationship between the uh, current chief of staff, uh, the second guy, uh, General uh, Yashar Güler, and then force comments seems very, very well. So we see a kind of uh, good cooperation between uh, among these uh, top echelons of the military. 
But uh, as I said to you, uh, if you want to open this black box, uh, military is not monolithic anymore. So I, this is one of uh, another arguments that I'm always saying that we see a kind of transitioning of Turkish insti military's institutional identity from a monolithic one to a polylithic one. So there are lots of power struggles within the military among different uh, factions in terms of their stance towards change, in terms of uh, you know uh, important military concepts uh, among the force commands, army, navy, and air force, and also in terms of uh, you know uh, senior level officers, uh, their uh, political sense and uh, you know uh, foreign policy related choices. So, uh, as I said to you, extremely personalized uh, relationship is important. And Mr. Erdogan seeing that, I think uh, if you remember Mr. Uh, Michael Dash model, you know, we have a kind of inter-service rivalry model uh, explaining many things in the States. So he has been trying to follow that. So he, is, he has directly attached the, in the uh, intelligence uh, to his presidential palace. And right now, uh, Turkish gender Maria, a kind of paramilitary force uh, in charge of law enforcement in rural areas in the inter interior ministry and Turkish police. And I have to say this, uh, Turkish interior ministry is the only civilian institution in the world having a full authority to use armed drones in counter-terror operations. And it will be a kind of uh, first civilian institutions in the state. We have a, with a kind of direct access to this medium uh, and high level defense, air defense uh, and ballistic defi defense uh, architect, architect of Turkey. So uh, see a kind of inter-service rivalry uh, checking, trying to you know, create a kind of dual a security mechanism. I think this is the approach that Mr. Erdogan has been trying to institutionalize so as to tame the military. We don't know the things uh, to being talked behind the closed doors because this is another critique that I'm always saying. All these processes are very, very secret, not transparent, uh, so accountability is not the case uh, at, the, at the moment. We don't know. And uh, getting back to this uh, uh, Turkish military's strategic identity and institutional c culture, this is a very important uh, uh, issue. I'm trying to understand still, uh, but I can say that after all these, uh, you know, uh, things, the military reforms, and particularly mass purges, particularly purges of these Western educated, you know, uh, officers. In, in, in the Turkish military, I can say that the Atlantis camp, you know, pre prioritizing the, uh, you know, pro-West sentiment, uh, you know, uh, caring about the ties between the U.S. and NATO, they have a kind of weakened position, and particularly those Eurasianists, you know, have a, a kind of upper hand at the moment, and then to some extent uh, conservatives, I would say. And today, I was just checking uh, my you know, uh, social media accounts. And then, uh, right now, this is the debate in Turkey is uh, you know, a journalist asking to an armor company commander uh, the, on the brink of entering Syria. And then uh, the journalist is asking this question, to where, to where, where are you heading to, where are you going to? And the company commander is saying that, to the heart of Islam. And then the secular, you know, people are criticizing this. You know, they are saying that this company commander should, you know, serve to the secular principles of the founding principles of the state. And we can't, I mean, we can't let Turkish military uh, to have a kind of religious uh, stance. And also this is hotly debate in Turkey. I really uh, advise my PhD and, you know, master uh, students to go deep into this. You know, there is a kind of paradox right now under discussion in Turkey, and I wrote some pieces about that in Turkish. Uh, the religious uh, and Turkish military's uh, interaction with the religion and secularism. So uh, at, at the ontologic level, we should provide a room uh, f uh, to military to stay away from the religion because we don't want Islamization of the military. But at the same time, we don't want a kind of hawkish military stance about the religious freedoms. Huh? So we want a kind of uh, creation of a kind of tolerant way of, uh, you know, militaries, uh, you know, uh, seeing of uh, religious issues. So uh, this is the paradox still under discussion in Turkey. Military is freedom from the religion and religious freedom within the military. So 
how can we find a kind of golden balance between these two? This is also still an issue under discussion. And uh, security and institutional identity and strategic cultures, Turkish military is in a kind of soul searching at the moment. And then national security councils, higher military councils, these are very, very important uh, you know, institutions in my, uh, in, in, in my thinking because at the senior level, at the political strategic level, both civilian decision makers and military strategy, military decision makers should have platforms like this to discuss things. Because uh, these uh, institutions are extremely important, but after uh, July 15, uh, you know, military uprising, I will say that National Security Council is right now dysfunctional. Both Secretariat and, and, and the Council is not functioning properly. And higher military councils, uh, I can say that it has its own independent agency. So these platforms are extremely important. So as to good get through these uh, you know, civil military frictions at the strategic level. I really care about their existing and I highly, you know, if I had a chance to advise, uh, to, uh, you know, uh, model or design a civil military relations, these uh, platforms should be the one to start first. Uh, not to directly go to the civilian side, not to directly go to the military side, but those adapters, you know, those, uh, how can I say, interlocutors, you know, uh, these mechanisms are much more important. Professional military education is extremely important. National Defense Universities and War Academies, another institution that we have to talk a lot about. Uh, I think, the, despite the fact that I have a military high school graduate, uh, at the beginning of my talk, if you remember, I emphasize uh, my uh, putting, of, putting on uniform at the age of 13. And, and this extremely hard indoctrination process four year in military high school, four year in military academy, one year in infantry school, so nine years of, you know, uh, how can I say, education, very isolated, very aristocratic, you know, uh, I mean, this is a very important factor. So I think it's a very positive thing uh, for the government to close down military high schools. Uh, that's why those generals, they hate me because of my idea, I mean, these ideas. And the retired ones, and then also some serving ones, and also I am on in favor of you know civilizing, civilizing uh, this professional military education. So very first thing that uh, I ask uh, the numbers of civilian faculty in that National Defense University. But again, coming back to this uh, initial and then the overall question right now, Mr. Erdogan has been struggling to find a way is hu civilian human capital deficiency on. Uh, civil uh, military uh, relations on defense and security planning and military strategy making he doesn't have uh, you know very capable civilian particularly women women empowerment is important here uh, you know uh, personnel uh, to cope with all these challenges and when it when you look at the military side of the story it's all toxic i don't like politics in turkey because it's all toxic all ex-generals, retired generals, they are in trying to uh, explain things under the, how can I say, very uh, heavy, uh, un under very heavy political baggages and ideological stances. So I can't say that what we need in Turkey, I, I, the, the first thing that I want to say is this, what we need in Turkey is a very lively, very robust, uh, very objective and neutral debate, debate. We need a debate but because of this toxic environment, it's impossible to make this uh, debate. And then coming uh, to this Russia, Israel, Egypt issues, I'm neither a policy maker nor a policy shaper. I'm an independent researcher, and I have a one vote to punish the government or to you know, uh, give a present to a government. So I can't say anything about that. I can't say anything about that. And uh, lastly, uh, the ontological issue, uh, the uh, ontological issue, and the critics about the theories uh, at the beginning of my presentation, I have to say that, particularly those young students, you know, uh, the PhD and master students, this is the ontological debate. So the debate, uh, the nature of the debate is: uh, Do we uh, should we treat as civilians? Should we treat military as an, uh, you know, another uh, breed coming from the planet Mars? 
the representative of the, you know, uh, the other world, or should we see them as the extension of our society, as the mirror of our society? Do we inherently uh, believe that uh, there is an inherently existing gap between the military and civilian, or there is no gap? This is the, how can I say, uh, ontological uh, point that all debates starts about. So that's why I want to get attention uh, to these ontological debates. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. This is uh, one of the best sessions, I think, uh, on Turkey. Thank for the moderator, for Dr. Michel Anglo. Thank for Dr. Mateen and Dr. Omar. Uh, now I will ask Dr. Sami to come to present the uh, uh, appreciation momentos for the uh, speakers and the moderator. Dr. Mateen. Dr. Omar Aslan. And Dr. Michel Anglo. Okay, thank you very much. We will have our last session at 3 o'clock uh, sharp. We will start. <laughs>